Well, if you notice during worship today, uh, it's, it's warm up here. It's always warmer up here than it is out there. And, uh, you know, Aaron, while he was leading worship, uh, did not have shoes on. And uh, I, I thought that was great. Uh, part of me, I thought about not wearing shoes. But I'm going to get very real, very real with you. Here's, here's the thing. Uh, at, at our church, if you look at our mission statement, our values, things like that, one of our values is authenticity. We like to keep it real. So I'm going to keep it real today. I, I get embarrassed about my feet. And uh, that's why I'm wearing shoes. Like, I, I have man feet. I have man feet. And uh, it, some of you are like, what does that mean? Others of you are like, oh, I know exactly what that means. Um, I, I have man feet. Uh, last year, we were going to be going to Hawaii and... Uh, one day, my wife looked at me and said, hey, babe, I'm going to go get a pedicure. You want to go? And I was like, no. And then she was like, hey, Tim, I'm going to go get a pedicure. Do you want to go? And I'm like, no. And she's like, I, I, I really think you should go, <laughs> right? And what I realized is she, she was uh, not just suggesting it, but she was trying to be polite. But here's what it was. I, I, I'm going to be walking around barefoot everywhere or uh, with my slides on. People are going to be seeing my feet. And she didn't want to be embarrassed to be with me, right? And so I, I went and I got a pedicure. How many of you have ever had a pedicure? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. If you've ever had a pedicure, if you're a lady, put your hand down. If you're a guy, keep it up. All right, look at that. <laughs> yeah, those are the real men right there. Um, that's bravery. I, uh, I went and did it. I was kind of embarrassed by it. Um, uh, you know, uh, Keith Galitz uh, from our church saw me in there and, uh, and uh, poked a little bit of fun, but I was like, okay, this is awkward. Um, it, was, it was difficult to sit there uh, because I'm incredibly ticklish. Um, the only time I've ever had a doctor walk out of a room on me was when I was at a podiatrist because I couldn't stop laughing. Um, but uh, yeah, it was hard not to laugh. I was shocked, literally, guys, if you haven't gotten one, I was shocked when they pulled out a cheese grater. Like, no joke. Uh, they pulled out a cheese grater for my foot. And uh, I was like, wow, I guess I, I really did need this. Um, it was amazing. And afterwards, I did not realize what it would do. I mean, next week is Father's Day. I, I have a wife, I have three daughters, and something amazing happened after my pedicure is I connected with my daughters in a way I've never connected before, <laughs> right? They were like, Dad, your feet look so good. And we just had this conversation that's like a conversation usually my wife gets to have with them, but instead I got to have it with them. And uh, yeah, you guys are like, where is he going with this? Um, beautiful feet, beautiful feet. Well, we said authenticity. How many of you wives in here wish your husband had more beautiful feet? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, three honest people, three honest people. Did you know the Bible actually has something to say about this? Did you know that? Um, let me read it, uh, Romans 10, 14 to 15, beautiful feet. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That's why we're going through the gospel of Luke. We want to be a church that is all about the gospel. We want to be a church, and you didn't realize it, that has beautiful feet. Absolutely drop-dead, gorgeous feet. We are all about the gospel of Jesus Christ here. And as we finish out Luke chapter 8, we're going to see a story that in a way seems like two stories, but it's... It's one that goes together. It is in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a very famous story. But through this, we want to learn more about Jesus Christ. And there's three questions I'm asking today. As we read through this story, what does this tell us about his character? What do we learn about his ability? And how does this story further his mission and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that, this is what we read in Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. 
And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored or begged him to come to his house, for he had only a daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. And Jesus went. The people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceived that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people that she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be made well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one of what had happened. This is just an incredible story um, when you look at this. And it's, it's one that's very famous um, in different TV shows or movies that you've seen about Jesus, if you've ever watched those kinds of things, um, it's one that is typically found in them. But let's go to the first question that I asked about this passage. What does this tell us about his character? About the character of Jesus Christ? There's a lot we could get from this, but I think it's important to note specifically that it tells us that Jesus sees and cares about what is going on. He sees and cares about what is going on. Here he is in probably Capernaum. Last week we learned that he had gone across the Sea of Galilee to the Gadarenes. He had cast a legion of demons out of a man, made the man whole and in his right mind. Then he got back in the boat and went back. So most likely he's in Capernaum, which was kind of his headquarters for doing ministry around the Sea of Galilee. When he's there, it's not just a few people that come and see Jesus. It is so many people that want to be healed by him, that want to hear from him, that the Greek says they are pressing in on him. It is the same word that they use to describe a mob of people. Have you ever been in a crowd like that where you can barely get through? I, I remember uh, when our girls were little, being in Disneyland on a spring break and trying to get through. And at the time, we had um, a big stroller with a big front wheel. And what I learned is if I just pushed and just kept going, right, things shaped like an arrow. We just got right through the crowd. But um, without that, you know, we would have been stuck just shoulder to shoulder. That's what is happening to Jesus. And yet, in the midst of this, two things go on. One, he hears, there is a young woman, about 12 years of age, and she's so sick that she's dying. 
And whatever Jesus had planned at that time, his plans went out the window and he started to go there to take care of the situation. He changed what he was doing because he heard there was a problem and he went to take care of the problem. Uh, This last week, I had the opportunity to speak at baccalaureate, and uh, while I was speaking at the high school at baccalaureate, one of the things I brought up was about leadership, and um, the way I like to define leadership is this way, that a leader is someone who sees what needs to be done, they do what needs to be done, and they bring others along with them while they're doing it, okay? And it's important to define it that way, because that's what you see in Jesus, There is something that needs to be done. He hears about it. When he hears about it, he goes to do it. And as he goes to do it, he brings his disciples along with him to teach him. They didn't have the word leader. That's not what they used. They used the term shepherd. Shepherd, and that's what a shepherd does. You look at it, and it's important because for a lot of us, a lot of us, a lot of people, we see what needs to be done. We see what needs to be done but we don't necessarily do what needs to be done. If you need help defining that, I mean, think of our culture today, how often there's a problem going on, and we are able to see it because so many people have their phones out and are taking videos of what's happening, but they're not the person in helping, right? Or maybe we can look at it this way. It's sort of like a lot of you who have... uh, a man in your life, it might be a dad, a husband, a friend, who are great at seeing what needs to be done. They sit there in front of their TV and watch all kinds of sports, and they're constantly telling the people on the screen what needs to be done, but they're not the ones actually doing it, right? A lot of us see that, and that's called being critical. Being critical. A leader also steps in and does what needs to be done. It shows that you care. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. There's a problem, he goes. As he's going and the crowd is pressing in along him, there is a woman who has been sick, uh, bleeding for 12 years. For 12 years. That's horrible. Uh, A lot of people have tried to make mystical connections. Uh, Some people are into like Hebrew numerology. And can I just say this? There is some significance at certain places in the Bible about numbers, but a lot of people try to take it way too far today. Note this, there's nothing magical about the fact that 12 is mentioned twice in this text. Basically, it means this, this woman who has been bleeding for 12 years in the year that her life turned upside down and became the darkest ever for her was the same year that for Jairus, he had his only child, a daughter. And for 12 years, his life was light. But they both end up in the same place, desperate for help. Jesus is walking through the crowd. This woman reaches up and it says that she grabs his fringe. What does that mean exactly? Um, Well, definitely it means that she grabbed the tassel of his prayer shawl, right? When you look at the uh, law, Jewish men were supposed to wear their prayer shawl. They were supposed to have a tassel that would be hanging on the back. And what we find is that in the Greek Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, it's the same word that's used here that means fringe, but it also describes that tassel on the back of a prayer shawl. Jesus would have been wearing that. He does say something about the men who would walk around and they wouldn't have normal-sized tassels for their prayer shawl. They would get extra-long tassels to say, look at my tassel. And uh, Jesus says, that, yeah, don't be like that, right? Don't be like that when you wear your prayer shawl. People have tried to say a lot about why she thought, if I can just come up and I can just grab that, There's possibility that she is looking at an Old Testament passage where it talks about uh, the Messiah coming and that he would have healing in his wings, and the word there used for wings can also describe the edge of a cloak 
or a garment, and that she somehow thought, oh, well, that's what that means if I just grab the edge here. But um, more likely, it's this. We have already read in Luke, and you can find it in Mark as well, that people were getting healed just by touching Jesus' clothes. Uh, You might have missed that a couple weeks ago when we were reading. It was saying that, that people were coming to him, and just to touch his garment, just by touching his garment, they would get healed. So more likely than anything else, she's hearing that. It's happened to other people. Maybe it can happen to me. And so she goes up and just touches him. He feels the power go out of him. That's just, that, that is something that's just amazing. Somehow, he feels power released from him, stops in the middle of the crowd and is saying, wait, who, who did that? Who touched me? Nobody knows. They can't figure it out. And finally, she comes up and is saying, it was me. It was me. Notice she is trembling. She is timid. She is afraid. In the first place, she didn't even go and talk to him face to face and ask him if she could be healed. Why? Because according to Jewish law, because she was bleeding, she could not participate in any of the worship services, not only in the temple, but also in the synagogues, and other people wouldn't have touched her with, for fear of becoming unclean. Think about that. For 12 years of this woman's life, she has been an outcast where people wouldn't want to be around her, wouldn't touch her. She, even if she wanted to go to different parties, different uh, bar mitzvahs, different uh, uh, worship services, she was not allowed to. For 12 years, she had learned to keep her head down and to stay away. She's afraid. Why did Jesus say, who touched me? Sometimes it's it's hard to know the tone exactly. I I know that was something I had to learn um, as a dad when my daughters were teenagers. When I would text them, they couldn't hear my tone. So sometimes they thought I was upset at them when I was not, or um, they would take something the wrong way. So that's when I started uh, using little emojis and stuff like that to try to communicate what was going on. You can't always hear tone. That's why sometimes when people uh, email me or text me, I'll actually call and be like, hey, can you read this to me? Because I I can't hear your tone in this. And for some reason, I'm reading this like you're upset at me. Are you or or not? And people will be like, oh, no, no, I'm not upset at you. I'm like, okay, I just took it the wrong way. We can't see Jesus' tone in this, but maybe just let's change it a little bit because I think a lot of us tend to think of God as being such a harsh God and judgmental and pointing fingers that sometimes we read the words of Jesus this way. Why in the world is he even stopping to say, the power went out of me, who touched me? Is it that he's mad, who touched me? No, not at all, because he does something here in this story that he doesn't do anywhere else in the Gospels. Nowhere else. When this woman, timidly, afraid, trembling, comes forward and says, it was me, his response to her is simply, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And it is the only time in Scripture where Jesus looks at a woman and calls her daughter. He honors this woman in a way like nobody else does. He calls her her daughter. And that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. He lifts her up in front of this crowd of people that would have known her as the outcast and suddenly puts her in a place of respect. He's saying to everybody, signaling to them, she is healed, she is clean because of me. And now she is my child. Awesome. He cares. He sees. He hears. Um, I, I've had an experience over the last year uh, with two different dentists. Two different dentists. How many of you love the dentist? You sick people. Uh, yeah, dentists, like, whoa. Uh, I, I, I've, I've had two new dentists in the last year. 
Uh, here was my experience with them. One, one dentist I went to came in um, I, I, while I was getting my teeth cleaned. I, I, I was thinking like, man, somebody in this office is really loud. Like, I could, just kept hearing this voice over everybody else's. And, and after a while, pretty soon, uh, this dentist came in like a whirlwind. And I was like, oh, that's who was so loud. And uh, I was like, wow, they just came in, uh, you know, just talking and, and loud. And, um, you know, I, I, I like dentists who are gentle, okay? Um, I, I just kind of freak out a little bit with dentists. And the reason why, if you don't know this about me, um, from here on my temple, all the way down through my cheek into my teeth and up around this side of my face is not bone. This is all a benign tumor. It's fibrous dysplasia of the upper right maxilla. And um, I d had it discovered when I was in fifth grade. Spent years up at OHSU uh, with, um, you know, students, medical students, uh, poking and prodding and testing and doing things. Um, they never removed the tumor. It's almost cutting off my optic nerve. Uh, it is into all of my uh, gums on my teeth on this side of my face. And... Uh, at the time, they, they were like, we don't really want to do anything unless we have to. Um, so graciously, the Lord healed me where it stopped growing after a time of prayer. Amen. Right? Here's the thing. This new dentist, she could have cared less. She could have cared less. She has a patient that all of these teeth over here are surrounded by a tumor. And uh, it's, it's sensitive. Um, there could be issues and stuff. And she wasn't saying a thing. And eventually I said, you, you did see that I have a tumor, right? She's like, oh, yeah, I, I read something about that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and just went on. I left that place. And I, I just thought, I'm not going back there. Like, she had a list of things she wanted to do in my mouth. It's my mouth, not hers. Um, you know, uh, there, there's, there's, I have this, this condition. She just didn't even talk about it, didn't care, didn't ask a question. This week I went to a different dentist. And she sat there and she was like, hey, can I ask you questions about this? What is it? And I, I know all the jargon, so I started listening out. She's taking notes, writing stuff down. And, and she was so gentle. She was asking me questions. Uh, when she saw that I had that, she assumed that I might have anxiety. So guess what? She didn't wear a right, white coat in because she didn't want to trigger me with a white coat. And the hygienist was wearing a black coat because she didn't want to trigger me. I was like, Wow, this is amazing. This is a dentist who cares. They like care about my condition and they're asking me about this and, and just about who I am and my general life. Uh, in fact, at one point, uh, this new dentist goes, um, so I see uh, you're under your occupation, you're a pastor. I said, yeah. And she goes, what type of pastor? I was like, oh, I'm, I'm the lead pastor at Christ the King Church. Oh. Hallelujah. That's what she did. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, do you go to church somewhere? And then we had this great conversation, and yeah, she uh, goes to a Korean church and stuff. But it was, it was a great experience. Why? Well, which dentist actually cared about me? The second one. Taking the time to get to know me, to talk to me. I just want to say that. That's something like uh, not only for Christ, but at our church that I, I, I'm very dedicated to. I remember at one point in ministry, I um, realized I wasn't really caring about people very much. Well, like, there was so much stress and so much going on that uh, there were jobs to get done, bills to pay, all this stuff, and I realized I wasn't really listening to people and I wasn't asking questions. I got convicted by it by uh, being at a, a, wor a worship conference and this worship leader said, yeah, you know, one of the things I have to fight is when I see someone walking by, I don't see them. I see them as a big bass guitar with arms and legs walking by, right? And I was like, wow, I think I'm treating people that way too. I had to shift and, and say, Lord, I, I want to see people the way you see them. And that's one of our goals, one of our dreams, prayers for this church, that we actually see, hear, and care about what's going on. It's one of the reasons why I, I try to say, hey, don't just come on a Sunday, but try to get involved in one of our small groups or one of our other ministries so people can get to know you. 
You'll hear me say things like, hey, be open and honest about what's going on in your life. We don't want to fix you. We don't want to throw you out. We want to pray with you and come alongside of you and, and, and see what God's going to do in your life. Jesus Christ sees, hears, and cares. He lifted this woman up to a place where nobody else had. Question number two, what do we learn about his ability? His ability. Well, uh, you're probably like, well, that's kind of low-hanging fruit because he healed. Yeah, he healed. He not only healed this woman, he'd been going around healing all kinds of people, but then later, this other young lady dies and he raises her from the dead. I've never seen that. He raises her from the dead. Over the last three weeks, Luke has organized these stories in such a way where we're seeing the power of Jesus Christ. The power. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Nothing is beyond him. So it starts with the story of him being asleep in a boat on the sea. A storm comes up, the seas are raging. If you came to second service when I preached that one, we uh, all sang the theme song to Gilligan's Island together, right? Um, it, it was just raging, the seas. And uh, Jesus gets up, they're afraid, they're saying, uh, don't you care that we're going to drown? And he not only rebukes the wind and the water, he rebukes them. Where's your faith? Of course he cares. Of course he cares. He calmed the storm and the disciples were afraid, showing Jesus had power over creation. Last week's story, he goes into a graveyard. There is a man who is filled with demons. When asked, he says, we are legion for we are many. All right? A Roman legion was 2,000 to 6,000 men strong. So somewhere between two and 6,000 evil spirits inside of him, he's able to break chains. Nobody can hold him down. And yet, Jesus casts out all the demons. It shows this. He not only has authority over creation, he has authority over the spiritual realm. Authority over the spiritual realm. And now in this story, we are seeing his ability in a new way. We've read stories about him healing people, and that is just amazing. One of the most incredible things for me as a Christ follower is when times we prayed for people and they get healed. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes the Lord gives grace in that way. We've seen that. But in this story... Jesus also has authority to raise people from the dead. The dead. And there's this passage where, you know, the people are saying, ha, 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 Jesus, what are you doing? Uh, she's dead. And he's like, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. Some people have tried to say what Jesus was really saying was she was in a coma. Nope, 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 nope. That's not what he's saying. Because if you go further in the text... It says that her spirit entered back into her. Her spirit was gone, right? That's a, just a body there. And by commanding her to get up, her spirit goes back in and she gets up. That's awesome. That is absolutely incredible. And what does that have to do with us? Well, let me encourage you with these words. These are the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Got that? We don't need to grieve like the world grieves. We still grieve, but it's a different type of grief because we have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him with him those who have fallen asleep. 
For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, we're raptured there, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah, that's the proper response there. Guys, check this out. Eschatology, the study of end times, what will happen at the end of the world? What will happen when Christ comes? One of the things that divides Christians so much is our beliefs on what that will look like. You have uh, people that are amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You have people that don't know what to think, and, and their, their ideas about the end are developed more by Hollywood, and we think that we're going to be getting wings and harps and floating around on clouds, right? Uh, no, not the case. We argue, we debate about it, but check this out. That's not the purpose of what Jesus says throughout Scripture about when he returns. Paul right here is like, take these things and encourage each other with them. Don't fight about it. Encourage each other. When I was younger, I used to fight about eschatology. I thought, I know what it is, and I thought that people that had a different belief were, one, either really not saved or uh, possibly just not as in the know as I was. How prideful and arrogant. How prideful and arrogant. I was uh, up in Washington one Sunday visiting my mentor, uh, Dave Browning, and uh, all of a sudden in one of his sermons... He shifted to talk about eschatology, and he got into an area of scripture about the end times that was super controversial, and all of a sudden, he moved right around the controversy, and he said, what does this tell us about the end times? And I saw him do something amazing. He brought his entire church together with what he said, and it was this, you know what? This, what do we know? Christ is going to return. Christ is going to return. And when he returns, all of our loved ones who have put their faith in him will come with them. And that's why we don't grieve like the world. We will see them again when Christ returns. And as they are coming, we get to go with them. That's Great news. And that gives us hope. That's the ability of Jesus Christ. And he foreshadows it throughout Scripture with people being raised from the dead. The third and last question is this. How does the story further his mission and declare the gospel? Um, I want to put up on the screen here verse 48 and verse 50 of the stories we read. Verse 48 says this. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And in verse 50, he said this, but Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be what? Well. She will be well. In both instances, with the woman who was bleeding for 12 years and is just healed by her just touching Jesus. She believed that if she could just touch him, that's all it would take, and she would be healed by him. And Jesus says, your faith had made you well. With this other girl, uh, he says to the father, to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be well. Why am I emphasizing this? Yeah, one was healed, one was raised from the dead, but it's interesting because that word there is sozo. And 
usually that word is not translated well. It's translated saved. You see it time and time and time again. Saved. And it gets us to this interesting dilemma of what is going on here. It's not the word that they use. The, the, the woman who was bleeding used a different word to be healed. It's a word in Greek where we get our word for therapy or therapeutics. That's what she's looking for. But instead, she's made well or she's saved. Was it that her condition was such that she was going to die from it? Maybe. But whatever it was, Jesus looks at her and says, your faith has saved you. With this other little girl, she's dead. Father is grieving. It's his only daughter. And does he save her? Yes, he raises her from the dead. I would call that being saved. But there are implications here that are much deeper about what Jesus' real mission is and about what it takes on our part to be a part of that mission. The woman who was saved by her faith because she reached out and touched Christ. What did she do? What did she do? She believed, and her belief led her to go to him. It's interesting because she didn't ask but she believed, if I just touch him, that is how awesome he is. If I can just get in his presence and touch him, I will be rescued, made well, saved. The little girl who died, who was brought back to life, how much did she do to bring that about? Not a thing. She was dead, and then she's alive. She was dead, and then she was alive. Uh, check it out. Was she believing that Christ would raise her from the dead? That's a real trip. She's not even the one believing. It's her father that's believing. She did nothing, but she received this incredible gift. And that's the thing about the mission and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about us, what we have to do. And some of you are like, yeah, you've said that over and over again. Yeah, but are you getting it? Or are you still trying to work out your salvation in your own strength? Or do you realize we work it out because it's him who works in us? It's about him and what he has done for us on the cross. What do we do? We believe and we call out and ask, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Uh, in, in a few Sundays, we're going to have Baptism Sunday, right? I, I, I don't know why I just said that like a superhero. I don't know. Um, but I, I just think it's going to be an awesome day if people do it. If people do it. Why do we get baptized? It's because the Word of God says that's our response to Christ. On the day of Pentecost, when people are hearing the gospel and they're, they're cut to the heart with their sin, they look at Peter and they say, what do we have to do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We'll be saved. That's why we get baptized. It's this declaration. It's, it's like a reaching out and grabbing a hold of a tassel. It's like a saying, Jesus, come. Uh, there's Someone needs salvation. You look at this and, and you hear me quote this passage a lot out of Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. All you're doing is believing and, and confessing. I believe it. I believe it. I'm calling out to you. The passage goes on, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, 
everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Read that verse with me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, how then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. 